Hi everybody, my name is Andrew Shikiar. I lead marketing here at Fido Alliance. I'd like to thank you all for joining today. Uh, today's webinar should provide you with various perspectives on strong authentication trends in, in government. Uh, we're honored to have several speakers on today's seminar to cover this topic, uh, as you'll see here, uh, including uh, Jeremy Grant, Managing Director for the, at the Chertoff Group, Adam Cooper, uh, Technical Architect for Identity Assurance at the UK Government Digital Service, Elaine Newton, who is the Standards Lead for Applied Cybersecurity at NIST. Additionally, we'll be kicking off today's webinar with a brief review and overview of FIDO's uh, vision and latest updates with FIDO's Executive Director, Brent McDowell. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Um, First of all, we encourage you to ask questions during the webinar. Uh, there is a question um, panel on your GoToWebinar client. You can enter questions in through there. We'll try to enter as many questions as we can during the webinar via the, the chat methodology. We'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end. Um, so if you have questions you want to save them till the end, that's fine. Otherwise, ask them midstream, and we'll try to answer them right away. Uh, one other thing, following the webinar, uh, you'll receive a survey. Uh, please be sure to complete this. Uh, your feedback is invaluable as it helps shape our webinar program moving forward. So we very much appreciate uh, your opinions on today's contents and our webinar program in general. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to FIDO's Executive Director, Brett McDowell. Brett? Thank you, Andrew. All right, so let's get right into it. We have a lot of content to get through today, and we definitely want to make time for your questions at the end. So first, let me talk to the history of the FIDO Alliance, give you a big picture, uh, when we were formed, why we were formed. So we organized this organization in 2012 and, and launched it and opened it up for any organization to join the FIDO Alliance in 2013 with a mission to solve the world's password problem and I will uh, unpack for you what I mean by the world's password problem. But here's some evidence of it. You know, it's a lot of articles in 2016 and for several years prior. Here's the American Banker and Fortune Magazine talking, you know, reporting on these huge multi-million and even billion plus uh, data breaches that have reached the headlines of the press in the past year. Um, and every year since we launched this organization to try to tackle and turn around the password breach problem, uh, we've seen data breaches increase uh, with uh, breaking the unfortunate milestone over over a thousand data breaches uh, just in the U.S. last year, uh, which is up almost 40 percent from the year before, and that's from the Identity Theft Resource Center. And we know from other studies such as Verizon's data breach report that the vast majority of these breaches can be attributed to you know, weak and stolen passwords and password replay attacks. So if we cannot get the world off of its dependency on password, we are not going to turn around this data breach trend, which costs companies real money, uh, as documented by the Poneman Institute study uh, showing, uh, that was several years ago, uh, nearly $4 million per data breach on average, and uh, that is only gotten more expensive uh, in the years since. So we launched this organization to tackle that problem and with just six companies and we now have over 250 uh, businesses from around the world including a number of government agencies, uh, two of whom that you'll hear from today, that have joined the FIDO Alliance with a very focused mission. We are trying to develop authentication standards so that there is a new way for users to authenticate to online services that does not share the vulnerabilities inherent in passwords. So improved security also designed for improved usability because we've all learned over the past 10 to 20 years that simply adding steps in the security process um, is not going to reach the long tail of internet users. It has to be a better experience or they will not opt in. Uh, everyone who's deployed second factor authentication as an option is painfully aware of the uh, traditionally low opt-in rates uh, from that. So we wanted to make sure that this new better security 
was also a better user experience. We go about fulfilling this grand mission of ours by developing specifications so that independent uh, product implementations, uh, device manufacturers, web application developers, that they can develop uh, their FIDO compliant implementation and it will just interoperate without you know, them needing to coordinate at all. So we have to develop technical specifications that provide for true interoperability between devices and online services. We also have to develop programs to ensure that these implementations interoperate, so test and certify these products, as well as educate the market on this new technology, uh, both businesses as well as consumers. And last but not least, ensure that FIDO authentication becomes the de facto standard way of authenticating on the internet going forward. So here are some of the, these are the companies that sit on the board of directors of the FIDO Alliance. I simply want to make the point here that we have market leaders from different segments with, with strong representation from both uh, technology innovation side, and basically the supply side of authentication, as well as the demand side of this market. So companies that know what's needed, financial service companies, payment companies, as well as platform device manufacturers, and even chip and silicon developers. So we have the market leaders, as you can see here. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go through all of them, but everyone from Google and Microsoft, Qualcomm, Intel, you know, RSA and Vasco and the enterprise, um, to uh, Visa and MasterCard and American Express and PayPal, um, ING, Bank of America. So it's a broad range, and that has helped ensure that everything that we develop in this organization solves a real business problem in a very informed way because we have the experts who are leading the market in each of their segments uh, driving the bus. Now, how does FIDO work? Um, just very briefly, uh, let, let's compare it to what we all use every day already, which is a password or better known as a shared secret. The point here is that with a password or even a one-time passcode, you have to give that secret to the application. So here the user is delivering their, their secret directly to the online application, typing it into a screen one way or another. This makes the user and their secret vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks and, and even you know what we see all the time, social engineering. It, that if you have to give away your secret to use it, then you can be tricked into giving your secret to the wrong party. Traditional email phishing attacks where you're typing in your password to a fraudster's website instead of uh, the authentic website that you thought you were logging into. And also one-time passcodes being intercepted in a very similar way. So what we've done is add this notion of a FIDO authenticator to this flow. So what's happening here on the left side of your screen, the user is authenticating to their device locally. They're doing some form of user verification. I am the same user that registered this device with the service. That is all happening on the device. A you know, standard example would be a fingerprint sensor on a smartphone. Right? So you're, you're authenticating locally to the device. Um, then the device, now knowing that it has the right user, it has the permission to use FIDO's uh, public key cryptography methods, which means your new secret is actually your private key, which is registered um, with each of the applications that you use it with. So you have a separate private key for every application, which is privacy preserving. That that private key is always on your device. You never give it away. All you do is sign, cryptographically sign, challenges from online services. So the online service here sends their challenge to the device. The device makes sure that they have the right user wielding the device, the use user verification, often biometrics and then it signs the challenge and sends it back to the online service. This means that you have removed those vulnerabilities around social engineering because the system simply does not allow the user to give their secret to the wrong party. And then on the server side, you don't have any secrets being stored on the server. So the, the idea that a giant database full of passwords you know, is an attractive honeypot for attack, a giant database um, uh, on a server 
full of FIDO public key credentials is useless to an attacker. Um, so there, we've, we've basically taken away the desire for that data breach, and we've taken away the means for that data breach. Now, it was very important for us from the beginning to do this with open standards for the following reasons. Um, when you want, before FIDO came along, if you wanted to, let's say, introduce biometric authentication, you would s select a vendor and do an end-to-end -end integration, probably with your own uh, mobile app or something like that. And that's still a, you know, a viable option in the market, but what Open Standards does is it gives you a way to uh, enable your infrastructure just once and get true interoperability with every FIDO certified device in the market. And as you'll see, there are many and many more FIDO devices in the ecosystem all the time. And we also engineered uh, a way for the online service to get some information about this device to decide how much that they trust the security properties of this device. This is through something called the FIDO metadata service. Um, and also, this takes you away the need to do these one-off integrations every time you want to introduce maybe a new modality uh, or enter a new market. Uh, so now you can just FIDO enable once and interoperate with every device in the market. So I've hit on usability, I've hit on security and ROI, but there's also a key privacy by design component to the FIDO authentication system. There's no third party in the protocol, so you don't have to worry about you know, correlation handles or anything like any third parties kind of watching where users are authenticating. It's direct from the device to the application. There are no secrets on the server, as I mentioned before, which saves you in the case of a data breach of that server. And biometric data, if it, that's used, you don't need to use biometrics for user verification, but if you do choose to use biometric data in your authenticator, then that biometric data must never leave the device. That is a requirement of FIDO certification. And that, of course, is privacy preserving for that biometric information. And there's no linkability. This is probably one of the biggest wins in our design. Uh, there's no identifier in a, in a FIDO device, no way to track that user and link their behavior across applications. There isn't even a way to link that user across different accounts on the same system. At least the FIDO protocol doesn't give you anything new. Uh, there are all the old you know, cookie methods, but there's nothing new that's being delivered by FIDO. So nothing for tracking or correlation. Now let's talk about how well FIDO authentication is kind of being received by the market. Here is a selection. It's not all of the deploying services, and it entirely uh, under reports on enterprises that are already using FIDO authentication, for example. But here are some of the leading brands uh, who have made it a point uh, to kind of publicly announce that they're supporting FIDO authentication and are really leaning in to drive the market. You know, Google, Bank of America, eBay, Facebook, just last week, you may have noticed, um, made a lot of news about their introduction of FIDO authentication. Dropbox, PayPal, GitHub, Salesforce, and in, in Japan, Entity Docomo, uh, the leading mobile network operator, in Korea, BC Card, the leading payment card network in Korea, China Telecom, JD.com, which is a huge e-commerce site in China, and, and many others. Uh, even Dashlane, this is really a password management application, um, evolving to you know, recognize where the puck is going, as they say, um, and adopting FIDO authentication into their system. So market leaders deploying FIDO authentication both uh, in a multi-factor using biometric scenario um, such as eBay and PayPal have, BC Card, but also as a st standalone second factor authentication scenario with what a form factor known as security key, which is what Google and Facebook and Dropbox uh, and Salesforce have deployed. Now, how are these deployments going live? Like, where are the devices coming from? Um, well, here is a chart that shows the level of adoption of devices and commercially available software. Uh, over 300 certified products are available in the market today. That's an increase of over 200% just in the past year. And these devices are 
cover a range of things. We have security keys. There are a lot of different security keys in the market now uh, to support those second factor deployments. And leading handset manufacturers like Samsung, Sony, LG, and Huawei, all shipping out-of-the-box support for FIDO-certified authentication using onboard embedded biometrics. In addition, even some of the deployments um, that I mentioned before have put their own uh, locked, you know, closed ecosystem uh, implementations through certification testing just to make sure they could truly interoperate with all devices. Some examples of that would be from eBay as well as Bank of America. And there are SDKs, uh, software development kits, that have gone through certification testing to make it easy for mobile application developers to simply add FIDO to the applications that they already have. This is the latest batch of uh, companies who have gone through FIDO certification testing just announced in the past month. And they are now part of over 100 independent companies uh, shipping over 300 different products collectively uh, in the FIDO ecosystem today. And I would point out Intel, uh, what they've done by bringing uh, FIDO authentication using biometrics for web applications directly into their components, making it easy for uh, PC manufacturers to add FIDO and biometrics. Um, that's now in market. And Hyundai Motor Group, we're starting to see the smart car, the connected devices, the Internet of Things, uh, adopting FIDO. So very briefly, now I'll, I'll shift from looking behind to looking ahead. Uh, these are some things to expect in 2017, and then we'll transition and hear more about FIDO in government and the rest of the speakers. So very briefly, we're going to see FIDO receive a lot of uh, web browser support in 2017 as our partners, the W3C, finalize the authentication specification there, which is based on the work that we submitted over a year ago. That should happen in the first quarter of this year. We've also partnered with EMVCO. This is the standards developing organization for the payments industry, uh, payment card industry in particular. We're working with them on a way to use FIDO authenticators and adding some capability to our FIDO authenticators to make that a very attractive, standardized way for payment applications to get uh, CDCVM credit, which is consumer device cardholder verification method. It's the way for a mobile payment app to prove that the cardholder is present for the transaction, which, taken to its logical conclusion, results in lower rates for the merchant um, than they would have to pay for cardholder not present transaction traditionally. We are also standardizing and bringing to market something called the Client to Authenticator Protocol this year. This allows you to use the FIDO authenticator in something like a smartphone or a wearable to authenticate even if your transaction is happening on a different device that you've never registered. It's a local protocol, so your smartphone can talk to your PC or tablet, even if you've never registered a biometric authenticator or other authenticator on that PC or tablet. So it's a way for that browser on the, your PC to talk to the, let's say, maybe fingerprint sensor on your smartphone. And last but not least, we're rolling out a number of new certification programs in 2017 uh, that will support backwards compatibility, uh, security testing, and proving the effectiveness of the biometric sensors in these devices. So with that brief overview of where we've come from and what to expect from FIDO Alliance in the future. I'd like to turn it back to Andrew to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Brent. <clears throat> I think that sets the stage for things quite well. Um, we had a couple questions about uh, whether or not we're recording this webinar and if the slides will be available. Uh, the answer is yes to both. Um, the recording and the slides will be sent out uh, as soon as we have them posted uh, to our website. So our next speaker is Jeremy Grant of Chertoff Group, uh, which is a global advisory firm focused on security and risk management with deep expertise in government and policy issues in North America and around the globe. Jeremy will give you his perspectives on today's featured topic, strong authentication trends in government. Jeremy. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for having me here today. 
Uh, as Andrew mentioned, uh, the Chertoff Group is a global advisory firm. We help clients through uh, a variety of issues at the intersection of government, finance, security, and business. Authentication is one of them, and in fact, I'd say the broader set of identity issues, in part because of how important it is not only to a modern approach to cybersecurity, but also to advancing the digital economy. And so we've been tracking strong authentication trends in government around the world, uh, in large part because of things that government does often has a huge impact on the rest of the market. So uh, just to start things off, authentication is very important to government for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, it's quite important to actually protect access to government's own assets. Uh, second, when you have an authentication infrastructure that works, you can enable access uh, to more high-value citizen-facing services, helping to bring digital government applications online. Uh, it also empowers the private sector to provide a wider range of high-value services to consumers for transactions that don't invo uh, involve the government at all. Uh, it can help governments uh, secure critical assets and infrastructure, again, more in the private sector, and can be helpful in promoting good security practices across the private sector. Today, as we talk to governments around the world, we find that they're seeking identity solutions that can deliver not just improved security, but also better privacy, interoperability, and better customer experiences. So FIDO is certainly something that's impacting how governments think about authentication. Uh, it's enabling support for models where somebody can bring their own credential, uh, in large part by taking advantage of the growing ecosystem of FIDO solutions and standards. Uh, it's also really helpful, uh, this whole BYOC concept, that when governments are looking to try and deliver two-factor authentication uh, for citizen services, there's not a requirement to actually issue citizens a separate token or app for multi-factor authentication. They can simply leverage something they're already using today. And it can be quite helpful in terms of developing applications that don't require citizens to create passwords for digital government services. Beyond that, it's delivering, as the, what I would view as the next generation of multi-factor authentication, better security, privacy, and interoperability than a lot of the first generation solutions that we saw in the marketplace. Uh, that uh, helps with better customer experiences, making something simpler and safer. And when governments are applying it to their own applications, it can deliver reduced costs for the government enterprise. So FIDO is already, in the few short years that's been around, impacting how governments think about authentication. Uh, for starters, I wanted to highlight the report that came out just uh, a month and a half ago from the U.S. Commission on Enhancing National Cybersecurity. This was a bipartisan commission established by uh, the White House back in April, charged with crafting recommendations for the next president. And the re uh, results had a major focus on authentication. Uh, in fact, uh, really honing in on the fact that so many of the major breaches that we've seen over the years, as Brett detailed earlier, have been uh, executed through an authentication attack vector, uh, they, they threw down the gauntlet here and said an ambitious but important goal for the next administration should be to see no major breaches by 2021 in which identity, especially the use of passwords, is the primary vector of attack. This is one of their core recommendations to the next president. And they went on uh, to look a little bit at how you could uh, also try to leverage other types of solutions uh, beyond the PIV card. Uh, for those who are familiar in the U.S., the, the standard uh, for uh, computer access, uh, for cyber access, is a smart card that contains several uh, PKI digital certificates. Uh, and they specifically flagged, uh, noting that the government has not been able to get to 100% strong authentication with that solution, that the next administration should look to provide agencies with updated policies and guidance uh, that continue to focus uh, on increased adoption of strong authentication solutions uh, that's not focused just on PIV, but rather let's focus on outcomes on a performance basis and try to get to 100% strong authentication in a year. And notably with both of these issues, uh, they specifically flagged the work of the FIDO Alliance, uh, noting that organizations today complying with FIDO are able to deliver secure authentication technologies on a wider range of devices. They listed mobile phones, USB keys, NFC, BLE devices, and pointed out uh, that you know, open source standards and specifications like those of FIDO uh, provide a very strong foundation for opt-in identity management for the broader digital infrastructure. Uh, it's not just in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, Adam Cooper, who's actually here from the U.K. government, will talk a little bit more about this, but the National Cybersecurity Strategy uh, that the U.K. government published in 2016, uh, uh, looking at uh, the range of activities that the country should take from 2016 to 2021, uh, focused quite a bit on ensuring online products and services coming into use are secure by default and flag both TPM and FIDO standards as key to that. And Adam will give a little bit more color on that when we get to his section. So a, a note on, on policy around authentication. FIDO as a next generation authentication specification offers governments newer, better options for authentication 
But one thing we've been seeing as we look around the world, particularly on the regulatory side and the policy side, is that governments may need to update some policies to support the ways in which FIDO is different. As a simple you know, matter of fact, as technology evolves, policy needs to evolve with it. So a few things to keep in mind uh, for anybody who's, who's tuning in from governments in the, around the world uh, today or is uh, engaged with governments. One is multi-factor authentication no longer brings the higher burdens or costs that we used to see with MFA. Uh, I've got a quote here from uh, here in the US, the Department of Health and Human Services. This was from a, a essentially an explanatory statement in October 2015 explaining why they weren't putting recommendations in place uh, for US medical systems to require multi-factor authentication to access patient records. And you can see the quote here. A commenter pointed out that current approaches to MFA are costly and burdensome to implement. So while I think the statement was true of a lot of older first-generation multi-factor technology, FIDO specifically addresses these costs and usability issues. Uh, it ensures that there's no longer a, a trade-off between security and usability or security and cost. Uh, instead, it's something that's really designed to get to that upper quadrant where you have both a great user experience and great security baked in. Uh, and that is starting to change the conversations, uh, certainly as we talk to governments around the world, around how they are looking at whether they should mandate stronger security when it comes to authentication. The second is that with things like FIDO, technology is now mature enough to enable two secure, distinct authentication factors in a single device. And I want to highlight a couple different government actions here. Uh, the first is uh, the work of the European Banking Authority over the last year. Uh, in December of 2015, the EBA published a discussion paper. They were tasked under the Payment Services II directive that had passed in Europe. Uh, to develop uh, technical standards for strong authentication for customers and payments. And the discussion paper uh, was, there were a couple aspects of it. One, it was written, in my estimation at least, as if most innovation in authentication had actually stopped with the creation of the one-time password. And second, it was very skeptical in terms of whether, particularly in a mobile device, you could have two truly strong independent uh, authentication factors uh, in that um, if they're both being delivered through a single device, you know, is there any way to actually make that happen? So I was really pleased to see in August when they put out their consultation paper, these are essentially the draft standards, we're expecting to see the, the final version come out next month, that they actually flagged that you can do this. Uh, in fact, they called out uh, uh, the, how you can use uh, the implementation of separated uh, trusted execution environments. This is something that FIDO leans on in many cases to give you a, a hardware uh, uh, basis for your security with inside a device. Uh, to ensure that you actually have two separate factors of authentication. And so I think the while we're still waiting to see what the final rules from the EBA will say uh, next month, uh, they've moved significantly to recognize uh, the fact that new products that embrace things like the FIDO standards are now on the market. They enable you to do things that you might not have been able to do three or four years ago. Uh, in the U.S., this has also been recognized by the U.S. government. Uh, starting, uh, I, I'm going to highlight uh, two different publications from NIST, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, the first was in 2014 uh, when a, a guidance was uh, released for derived uh, personal identity verification or PIV credentials. Uh, they basically flagged that the White House would have to update guidance to remove requirements that had previously been in place that one factor be separate from the device accessing the resource. And the specific reason for this was that the evolution of mobile devices and particularly the fact that most devices you buy today now come with hardware architectures that offer highly robust and isolated execution environments. Think of the truck set execution environment, PPM chips in, in many laptops, uh, the secure enclave in Apple devices. These are all allowing these devices to achieve very high-grade security without the need for a physically distinct token. Uh, and a lot of this, I think as Elaine will, uh, Newton from this will talk to you about today, is also reflected in the new NIST draft digital identity guidelines that were actually just released, uh, I believe, for public comment yesterday. Um, and I, I don't want to step too much on the lane, so I'll just leave it as that. Uh, the third thing we've been seeing is that local match biometrics has matured and is now viewed as an important authentication factor. Uh, and I think uh, Elaine will be able to talk a bit about that as well and some of the work that NIST is doing uh, around measurement of biometrics as an authentication tool with the, the strength of function for authenticators or SOFA effort. Uh, but there was also an announcement just a couple months ago that was quite interesting that came up from Taiwan from their Financial Supervisory Commission, uh, where they previously would allow biometrics to be used only if they were stored and centrally matched. Uh, they changed some wording in it that now uh, specifically allows local biometrics matches an authentication factor 
And the word we've gotten talking to some folks in Taiwan that are close to the FSC there is that with this new guidance, you're going to see three new FIDO pilots rolling out this year specifically for banking and, and payments, uh, leveraging these new standards, taking advantage of this uh, evolution in uh, the way that they wrote their regulations on biometrics. So uh, all in all, you know, interesting progress as you're starting to see governments react to this next generation of more modern, uh, secure, easy-to-use authentication solutions hitting uh, much of it, you know, driven by the FIDO standards and the wide embrace that Brett detailed uh, of them earlier uh, in this webinar. Uh, so, you know, finally, I would just say, as you know, we engage with governments around the world, around the world, and talk to them about cybersecurity. Uh, where authentication comes up, FIDO is something that really delivers on a number of key priorities. Uh, security, as Brett, you know, highlighted earlier, you have authentication using strong asymmetric public key crypto. Uh, vastly superior to the old shared secrets model because there's nothing to steal on the server and leveraging biometrics is a second factor but not the only factor. Uh, on privacy, you have it architected up front, uh, particularly in Europe where GDPR is coming online, uh, those regulations quite soon, uh, and there will be additional risk uh, uh, to leveraging you know, certain types of security or certainly biometric tools. Uh, the way privacy is built in, uh, putting a premium on, on uh, eliminating shared secrets uh, eliminating uh, biometrics that could be stored centrally uh, and you know emphasizing consumer control and consent uh, really helps uh, to, to drive things uh, in a good direction toward the interests of policymakers. Interoperability, uh, as Brett noted, the FIDO 2.0 specs are in the W3C standardization process and you've got a, a FIDO certified uh, product list uh, that you know continues to grow at a rapid clip each month. And finally, usability, uh, understanding that Poor usability can be a security vulnerability. The fact that you have solutions designed with the user experience in mind, uh, having that be the first priority, uh, security built to support the user's needs, not the other way around. You know, collectively, these are four things that really hit the nail on the head for what governments around the world are looking to encourage in the marketplace. And so we're, we're quite encouraged by some of the policy and uh, standards and regulatory changes we've been seeing from different governments that are paving the way for FIDO to be used uh, more widely uh, across the world. Andrew, back to you. Very good. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so our next speaker today is Adam Cooper from UK Government Digital Service to talk about some of his agency's activities and perspectives. Adam. Thank you, Andrew. And hello, everyone. Uh, so thank you for, for that, Jeremy. There's lots of lovely links into what I'm going to talk about, which is great. So if we go on to the first slide. So Gov UK Verify is what I'm going to talk about first, and this is really the UK's national EID system, and it's the new way that we use to allow our citizens to sign into government digital services. But also, we've tried very carefully to make it very much a safer, simpler, faster experience for them. And what we've created is we've created a framework of what we call identity providers or certified companies, which are certified against outcome-based standards for identity assurance. Now, we made very careful to make sure that our standards were outcome-based so that we weren't tied directly into any particular technologies or methods. That said, we have very carefully monitor technologies like FIDO to make sure that we're aware ourselves from an insurance point of view and understand what, what's going on and feed into those discussions. because. We care very much about making this experience of signing into a service as simple and as secure for our users as possible. We're also at the stage now where we want to move out from Verify as being something that provides access to government services, but also to allow those identities to be used elsewhere as well. So reuse of those identities in the private sector is very much important to us. So concepts like Bring your, bring your own uh, device are very much part of this. So we've got, I mentioned we had a range of uh, certified companies. We don't just have a single certified company, that, so it's not one identity method. There are actually seven, and they're all commercial organizations, and they're all certified to independently of us uh, to the standards that I mentioned. Why do we do that? Well, we recognized very early on that what we wanted to do is create a market, and that market would 
We wanted to be very innovative and to offer different options and greater coverage to our users because we recognize that not everybody wants to do the same thing. And that's been great because we've ended up with uh, thousands of different options for verifying identity uh, throughout those different identity providers, but also different methods of signing in, which are more appropriate to different people. Um, and we're quite proud to be, that we are one of the first governments to actually offer U2F, for example, so FIDO devices as part of our, as one of our identity providers' sign-in capabilities, which is absolutely fantastic for our users. And as I say, one of the key concepts behind this is outcome-based standards, and that's been very important to us. So it gives us the opportunity to have a very innovative group of identity providers, and that also gives us choice and gives our users choice. It also creates opportunity because it means that we're not tied into a particular way of doing things, and neither are our identity providers. So we can actually attack different sectors and different, different demographics, by doing things slightly differently. And that competitive market drives our identity providers to do things differently and to adopt the best appropriate methods for our users to access services. And what do we do with all of these standards? We publish them publicly. It's always been a, a key theme to what we do in government digital services that we're very open about what we're doing. So as soon as we create a standard or create a technology, we actually publish it openly. Um, I won't go through all the different documents that are on there for time reasons today, but by all means go to GovUK and have a look at those standards. Um, they have, there are two key standards in there, what we call Good Practice Guide 44 and Good Practice Guide 45. Uh, 44 is all about the credentials used to uh, sign into a service, and 45 is all about how you verify identity. The two are linked together in our world to create something uh, which we call a level of assurance. And there is an operations manual that is also included in this which ties those together to show how you might actually create an IDP, an identity provider, and the additional requirements operation that go along with that. All of that's on there. Um, I'm, we are going to kick off a consultation group across industry looking at the standards that we offer, hopefully in February or March this year, so in the next few weeks and that will allow industry to input into where we go next with standards, which should be very helpful for everyone. Um, the IDAS regulation is something that we've been heavily involved in. It's a European standard for cross-border interoperability of EID. It came into law in September 2014, and there is a mandation point in September 2018 where all 28 member states, not including the UK at that point perhaps, uh, will have to automatically accept any notified EID schemes by the other member states. And it's, one of its key tenets here is to promote the reuse of that identity across borders, to make it easier for users to interact. And it is very much part of the treaty of the European Union to allow free, free movement and free trade. The regulation is publicly available. It encourages cooperation between the member states, which is extremely important so that they work together to do this and we've actually defined all the standards together and so for example there are standards for levels of assurance in the same way that we have in the UK, again outcome based uh, and are all available publicly as well. Um, one of the interesting things is that we're now seeing things like PSD2 and AML4D pointing towards the use of electronic identity through EIDAS and that may well be another method for people to access these services. It's certainly something that's of great interest to the banks at the moment, and UK banks have been very much interested in that as well. Can we move on to this one? Yeah. So, one of the things that Jeremy mentioned was how in the UK we published in 2016 our national cybersecurity strategy, and that has a number of objectives, the first one of which oh, I'm going to talk about today anyway is objective 5.2.3. If you read the PDF, uh, it's uh, rather long, so I'm not going to recite it all here, but one of the key parts of that is that we're trying to make sure that online products and services by 2021 will be secure by default. And that's quite a, a lofty and uh, ambitious in some ways thing to say, but I think a very important one because that's where we should be aiming and 
to achieve this, we're going to have to do quite a lot of interesting things. So we're going to have to start leading by example, which we, we do to, a, to quite a certain extent already, but even more so. And we're also going to have to start collaborating more closely with industry. Now, we do that as government digital service. Other areas will need to do that. Uh, changes to the National Cyber Security Centre of late allows them to do that, which is very important. But it means that what we're going to have is far more collaboration like we do with Verify and industry, and hopefully that will get us to where we need to be for 2021. One of the big things that we're going to need to do, and this is pulled out actually in, in the strategy, is to, and I quote on the next slide, emerging industry standards such as FIDO, uh, which should not fill out passwords, us, is exactly something we should invest in in the UK, because they do give us this capability, and as Jeremy and Brett have already mentioned, they eliminate some of the risks previously seen with shared secrets, and that can only be a benefit and help us to protect users, as we've stated in our objectives. Now, we do many, many things in government digital service that are related to all of these subjects. Uh, we do a lot of work on standards. We do a lot of international work that I haven't even touched on here, and work very closely with our US colleagues as well, for example, on standards. And I urge you all to have a look at our blog, that covers everything we're doing, we're very good at telling people what we're up to, and it'll give you some background and pointers to the different projects we're involved in. Hopefully that's been of use to you. Thank you. Hey, thanks Adam, that's great. Um, so our last speaker today is Elaine Newton of NIST, uh, to talk about recent developments in biometric guidance. After Elaine's presentation, uh, we will um, open things up for Q&A, answering some of the questions that have already been asked, as well as any other that you submit. Elaine? Thanks, Andrew. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or morning or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of a couple of projects that are related to authentication generally, but really drill down on biometrics. The first one we call the SOFA project. Um, this stands for the Strength of Function for Authenticators. And we're focused on biometrics for this, this first round of the project, and we call it SOFA B. Uh, the reason we started this project is there's been a long time uh, a need for having more measurement and the ability to compare the strength the security strength of biometrics versus other authentication factors, passwords, crypto keys, and the like. Uh, and at the same time, there has been um, a revolution in the biometric sensors that are available to the average customer because of smartphones. Um, this change has created a need for for more guidance specifically on biometrics, so we chose to frame the the, the SOFA project around um, what what's needed for biometric security and then how can we compare that to passwords and crypto keys. In starting off this project we first looked at a basic biometric system which is symbolized with the blue boxes. So you have some standard, for lack of a better word, uh, sub-processes within a biometric system in, in any modality. You first have to have the user present their biometric to a sensor. The data is captured, the signal is processed, and in the authentication phase, there's comparison between what was stored at registration to, to, that, uh, to the, what was captured at the sensor and then a decision is rendered to accept or reject um, the comparison that was made. When we looked at this uh, at, from the point of view of vulnerabilities, which you see in arrows 1 through 11, we tried to come up as a team with ways to mitigate the vulnerabilities, and we quickly discovered that most of these vulnerabilities are dealt with in the traditional cybersecurity, cyber hygiene methods, such as encryption, mutual authentication, limiting of uh, limit the unsuccessful attempts that are allowed 
for a, a user or attacker at the sensor. Only a couple of points are specific to biometrics, so we've decided to drill down on those specific points that make biometrics different from other factors to be able to make a, a basis for comparison. Next slide. Those two factors are presentation attacks at the sensor, meaning that someone, an attacker creates a spoof, such as uh, holding up a photo of a person for facial recognition or creating a fake fingerprint from a, a mold made uh, from Play-Doh, for example, from any number of materials. And the other is the false, uh, sorry, the, the matching probability. Um, and with passwords and crypto keys, as long as they're entered correctly, you, you don't have any error. It's either an accept or reject. Biometrics are probabilistic, and you get a score back when you compare what is registered for a user and uh, compared to what is uh, brought to the sensor at a, a future point in time. And that creates errors, which could be false accepts or false rejects of the person at the sensor. So those two aspects are unique to biometrics, and they create error rates. So we're using shorthand the PAD presentation attack detection error rate to mean that an attacker successfully gets in using a spoof at the sensor. The the false match rate is the probability that an attacker randomly matches uh, the pattern of a user and they're able to get into the system. So I talked about the false match rate and the PAD, the presentation attack detection error rate. And we also wanted to incorporate effort because that's very different between when you compare biometrics to other modalities. And when we thought about the effort, we also wanted to think about what an attacker knows. And we created a, a way of looking at um, attacks according to what an attacker would know. So one is zero information, where the attacker knows nothing about the user account they're trying to break into. And this would be, for passwords, it's the typical brute force attack of trying every combination. For biometrics, this, the, the equivalent would be creating spoofs randomly or getting a lot of people together to try to, um, to randomly match the user by putting their finger down or their face in front of the sensor hoping that just laws of statistics, they, they find a match. Um, just to add to that, there, it, a lot of biometric systems operate between, let's say, 1 in 100 to 1 in 100,000 false match rates. So you've got to get a lot of people to do that kind of attack. Another attack is targeted t attack, when the attacker is going after a specific user and knows some information about them. So the attacker for a password or PIN would try to shoulder surf to figure out what the, the PIN is or find the piece of paper where users might be writing down their passwords and keeping it at their desk. For biometrics, um, our biometrics are not secret. So if you're going after a specific user, you can go to Facebook, for example, or anywhere um, on the internet to get a picture of of a specific user, if it's face recognition that's being used, or fingerprints, you could you know lift off a, a phone or a glass or any number of objects, and then they have to create the artifact. So there has to be some effort to for and it, it varies from modality to modality, but an attacker has to create the spoof, and and that's some level of effort. Next slide. So we wanted to capture this through some equations, and I'm just going to give you a couple here. If you want to get more information, um, I'll, I'll tell you the URL in a moment. But the SOFA, the strength of function for authentication, 
for a zero information attack for biometrics, we concluded is proportional to the effort it takes to break into the system over the product of the false match rate and the pad error rate. And, and that product is the probability that somebody is going to, an attacker is going to be able to successfully break through the biometric system. So similarly with passwords or, or crypto keys, that SOFA equation for a zero information attack is effort times the number of probabilities that uh, the password or, or the crypto key presents. So in other words, you, we hear about entropy. Entropy is the log of that number of combinations. Next slide. Okay, there's some breaking news on NIST Special Pub 863-3. Just to quickly tell you about um, the history of that document. It's been around for a little more than 10 years now. Um, the third revision, made the, the second major revision, but the third revision of that document is out for comment as of yesterday. And at, it's open for comment through the end of March. There have been a lot of changes uh, in it to update it. And with respect to biometrics, we've been asked by the biometric community many times to try to um, update that guidance. So what we've done is something very much based on what I was presenting a moment ago when it comes to the SOFA B framework. So we've tried to address the false match rate, the presentation attack detection error rate, and the ability to revoke a biometric, um, whether it's through two factors uh, for doing local matching. We've also presented a way to deal with it for central matching. And we've addressed some other privacy uh, issues with it when it comes to biometrics. I just want to emphasize that when you hear about biometrics, that the something you are factor, um, there's there are two things, there are two aspects that, that need to be checked. Um, the distinctiveness of the pattern, which is captured with the false match rate, and whether that pattern is being presented by the, the person that it belongs to, so the liveness. Um, and that, that document, both of those documents can be accessed through pages.nist.gov. Uh, for SOFA, it's uh, pages.nist.gov slash SOFA, all in caps. And for 863, it's pages.nist.gov slash 800 hyphen 63 hyphen 3. Thank you. Okay, great. <clears throat> so thanks, Elaine. And thanks for sharing that, uh, that breaking news as well. I'm sure everybody appreciates that. So I want to move into uh, Q&A now. We have around 10 minutes. We can maybe carry over a few minutes. Um, I want to start with questions that have already been asked. And then if anyone else has questions, please uh, submit them through the, the question panel on the GoToWebinar client. Um, so first question, um, can the device hardware, can the, can the device be hardware cloned or use app share slash app copy to different device? Uh, Brett, do you have any um, feedback on that? Sure. So what that question is getting to is recognizing that the secret in a FIDO credential is that cryptographic private key. And so the level of trust you have that that device, that that private key um, is still tightly bound to the device that registered it, it, that is a critical assessment if you're going to give the presence of that private key credit as a what you have, you know, physically what you have authentication factor. Is it tightly bound to the device itself? Um, it goes into the threat model and everything else. So this question is getting at how portable, how vulnerable is the private key from being extracted off that device, you know, and maybe cloned, copied, moved around and put on another device and then spoofed from another device. Um, this gets into security certification program, which I mentioned in my um, roadmap discussion. We're going to start testing for this. Uh, right up until today, FIDO Alliance only tests for conformance and interoperability. 
we don't test the security characteristics of your device. We're going to start doing that in 2017. And there are going to be different levels of security certification. Um, and you know, depending on how much uh, security uh, capacity the device has, how well protected, how many attacks your device um, mitigates will move you up that uh, ladder of security levels. So that's coming. A very poorly implemented authenticator uh, could be cloned, and, but a very well implemented authenticator uh, should not be clonable. And that's why we will have this new test so that the market can tell one from the other. OK. Thank you, Brad. Uh, next question. Um, can you speak to the relationship, if any, between FIDO and X.509 updater changes? Uh, Elaine, can you speak to this, or perhaps Jeremy? Andrew, let me take a run at that one as well, just kind of at the high level. The FIDO Alliance works with a lot of standard setting bodies um, where we need to collaborate, such as the Bluetooth SIG. We have a Bluetooth binding for our uh, security key form factors. As one example, W3C uh, is another, and there are others. Um, we're not actively collaborating uh, with the governing body over X509 certificates, but our protocols do use X509 certificates. So you will see normative references in the FIDO specifications to X509 standards. Uh, we use it for uh, attestation, validating the attestation chain to make sure that the device is an authentic device. And we also use it um, you know, in recommend recommendations around TLS implementations. Okay. Does anyone else want to uh, add further context to that? Okay. Adam, I have a question for you. Um, for verified ecosystem of approved suppliers, how does the government not become reliant on those technologies? Um, can you expand on what you mean uh, by focus on outcomes instead of supplier? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we explicitly didn't want to get tied into a particular supplier or a particular technology. What we wanted to focus on in our standards were the outcomes for the user. So if we dis in our standards, if you, if you take a look at them, what we actually do is we describe what should happen during verification and what should be the outcome, not how you should actually do it, which allows the market then to be innovative and provide a solution to us that we take through our own assurance process but then uh, are independently audited to prove that they are actually providing a quality service that delivers that outcome. Why did we do that? Well, it allowed innovation in the first place. We weren't pointing suppliers down a particular route. I mean, if you ask a supplier for a particular thing, you'll get that particular thing and nothing else. That tends to be what happens. What we actually wanted to do was to tell the suppliers, well, actually, we want some a strong verification of identity and strong means of authentication and tie that together in a way that we can express that uh, generically to our services so that they can understand it, and regardless of which supplier it is. Ah, okay, well, there are many methods of doing that. Fantastic, because that's great for the public. They have choice. It's great for us because it builds that competitive market where they're competing for the the users to verify themselves and sign in. It drives down cost. So all these things are a plus to us, and it's meant that we can actually add new suppliers into the loop if we want to. So we have a different, slightly different set of suppliers now than we did when we first started out. So there are some new guys in there who've only been with us since the last year. Fantastic. That may change over time. Uh, so I've been there right from the beginning, but it allows us that flexibility and eliminates that tie-in. Does that help? Yeah, thanks for that added context, Adam. Uh, here's a common question we get. I think it's important to clear up. Grant, maybe you can handle this. Um, what if I lost my device and got a new device, so I need to generate a key-like password reset recovery, as we do now? How is this handled in the FIDO world? So basically, how do we how do we handle um, lost devices? So it right now, the deployments that you see in market 
are bootstrapping your FIDO authenticator registration off of a pre-existing credential. So whatever credentials you have today, that's usually where you start your session when you are registering your FIDO authenticator. You still, but once you establish your FIDO authenticator, that online service now has a much more reliable um, uh, signal for authentication, but they still need to look at all their other you know, risk-based backend uh, signals as well. So device recovery right now is handled in a similar way as account recovery for other credentials. But given that we take our mission seriously of actually supplanting the world's dependency on shared secrets, that means we have to have a more robust answer to, to that and we need to do that soon now that FIDO is going more and more mainstream, such as last week's uh, deployment announcement from Facebook. We have to have a systemic way to deal with the disaster scenario. Um, in the short term, what you're seeing is some of the aggressive services that really want to move their users off of passwords, um, they're looking at things kind of like, well, if you register three devices, I've heard that number you mentioned a lot, three devices and we'll let you turn off passwords um, because we, you know, we really don't think we're going to run into a scenario where you lose all three. Um, at least it's going to be very, very rare that you lose all three. So you, you use the other devices to register new devices. But everyone does have to deal with the, uh, the total disaster scenario, the hurricane scenario, where you have legitimately lost all of your devices. And so for that, uh, we're actually launching an effort to um, analyze and come up with some recommendations, some industry best practices around the lost and stolen device. There's a white paper effort right now in our deployment at scale working group, uh, which is a working group of online service providers sharing lessons learned and best practices. And account recovery is a critical issue because until we have a very trustworthy account recovery system that can survive in the face of all dev devices being lost, uh, I don't think we'll get to that, yeah, that last mile of actually deprecating you know, all use of passwords. So we're, we're focused on it. We don't yet have all those answers, but it's something that members in the Fight Alliance are working on together. Okay, great. Uh, so we're going to run a little bit over here. Uh, let me um, take another question. Um, is it a <coughs> around biometrics? Um, a one of our vendors on the panel or on in the attendance has this question. Uh, the bank had this concern that the biometrics has to be enrolled on every device. You know, do we have feedback on that? So maybe a little more color on our approach to um, device matching for biometrics rather than remote matching. What are some of the pros and cons of that? You know, what, what, what's the feedback we're seeing from the kind of business community? And Brett, I think you'd be the right one to, to address that. Sure, I'm going to tag team this with Jeremy because it's something that he already touched on in his slides. Um, this is getting to the question of, you know, some institutions are still looking at multi-factor authentication theory from the perspective that they can't give the credential credit for being a what you are authentication factor unless they're managing the biometric template themselves. So these IT managers um, or policy makers uh, are, consider that a requirement, table stakes for giving you basically biometric credit is that's only if we manage the template, therefore the matching has to happen on the server. That's kind of a traditional historic uh, view of it. Well, what we've been doing in the past year is demonstrating that the FIDO model was designed to give that same assurance without the risk and overhead of needing to match the template on the server. So, Jeremy, if you want to just kind of add some color to there and some of the movement that we're seeing in traditional analysis of that question. Sure. No, I, I think it's a good way to frame it, Brett, and it's a great question. I think the, you know, to me the thing that stands out um, is the, the advent of, you know, the fact that pretty much every commercial device people are buying today, you know, has, I would say at a minimum, a, a camera and a fingerprint sensor that can be used uh, for local unmatched biometrics is really starting to change the equation in the authentication marketplace. Uh, one, because you don't actually have to provision 
uh, separate hardware, or in many cases even software, to, to capture and process the biometric, uh, and two, because a lot of these devices are also being shipped uh, with some sort of an isolation environment. You know, we talk about things like, like T or TPM chips or secure enclave. Uh, you know, it, it's really quite a shift in the marketplace and that the primitives are all there to be doing very strong, very secure on-device biometric authentication. Uh, and then from a policy perspective, uh, I, I think while, you know, from our firm as we look around the world and we are still seeing, you know, some solutions that are relying on central matching of biometrics for authentication, uh, we're increasingly seeing uh, laws, regulations, policies coming out that will either, you know, specifically flag this as something that's a challenge. For example, in Canada, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner uh, has, has stated that centralized storage of biometric data heightens the risk of data loss and, and, and appropriate, inappropriate cross-linking of data, so they'll actually advocate for uh, avoiding it. In other cases, you have more uh, general uh, things coming online, say like the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe, uh, that basically are forcing every organization to really contemplate what sort of data that they collect and store and anything that's high risk, they have some, some real incentives in terms of uh, potential loss of, of, you know, significant fines up to, I think, you know, 4% of your annual revenues uh, to, to cause people to take a, a much more risk-averse approach. So to me, it's a combination of, of technology advances, marketplace advances, and, and evolution in the regulatory framework that's really driving uh, uh, companies around the world to uh, focus more on, on local match solutions as opposed to central. And just to drive that point home, Jeremy, I believe you what you reported earlier today was specifically that the Taiwan government changed that exact regulation. They now allow uh, local match, and that was uh, only because they learned how uh, FIDO worked, and they, they think that that is a good model. That, that's correct. I think, again, you know, new next generation authentication solutions like FIDO hitting the marketplace are prompting regulators to, I would say, re-examine some of their assumptions. I think we see this not just in Taiwan, but, you know, governments we talk to around the world in terms of how they're looking at this topic. Um, you know, regulators, I think, historically aren't always paying attention to the, the latest and greatest or what's considered cutting edge. Um, but with things like FIDO, it's gone from cutting edge to really state of the market when you start to look at the solutions that are out there, and that is prompting some rethinking of how to craft some policies in the space. Very good. Well, thank you. Let's, let's wrap up here. We're, we're a little over the uh, allotted time. I appreciate uh, all of our speakers and panelists today. Thank you all very much, and I appreciate all of you in the audience. We had uh, many attendees from all over the world. This is kind of going through the attendee list. Yeah, I think we have every continent represented on this in this audience. Um, any questions that were not answered, uh, we will follow up with you uh, directly, and uh, you'll also be receiving uh, follow-up email uh, with links to the archived video and the slides. And one last reminder, uh, please do take the survey uh, when you log off this, uh, log, off the, log off the WebEx, or the go to, excuse me, when you log off the GoToWebinar or when you receive the follow-up email. So thank you all again, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on a future FIDO webinar.